slides after the fact. So again, thanks for joining us. Uh, looking forward to getting into it. Now, that being said, um, VCGI, so Vermont Center for Geographic Information, as I mentioned earlier, we are a division of the state's Agency of Digital Services. We basically have three fundamental tasks for those of you not familiar with us. Uh, we build foundational spatial data sets. Uh, LIDAR is one of many of them. Um, there are others, including our statewide aerial imagery program, our statewide parcel program, and more. But these are foundational layers that lie underneath many other bits of information that allow users from all different walks of interests and uh, needs to create information using them or built upon them. We also lead the development of what's called the statewide Ge geographic information system or VGIS uh, and the coordination it requires. So that means we partner with agencies and divisions across state government, across municipal governments, as well as quasi-governmental organizations such as regional planning commissions, uh, academic institutions, et cetera, to make all of this information ideally standardized and freely available in a somewhat understandable format. And then lastly, we uh, seek to empower data access, visualization and use, whether that's giving presentations and talks like the one we're at today, or uh, simply by building applications, some of which we will uh, express today and show that, you know, do certain things uh, or any combination of things that allow you to see and use our information that we make freely available. So an overview of what we're gonna cover today, again, this is an introduction. So it's very much a high level, um, kind of talk as if you were entirely new to this arena and obviously there we'll start with you know explaining what what is LIDAR what what are its components so some things that comprise um, what LIDAR is perhaps you've had some experience perhaps you're entirely new but we tend to begin with the basics uh, and in so doing we were going to give some examples of who uses LIDAR particularly from sort of professional or application type uses and what what they might be using it for and then thirdly we're going to get into some ways that are relatively simple or straightforward in accessing uh, the LIDAR derived products that we've made today particularly through some applications that are built within your browser that you can go to our URL and, and look at things and create or at least turn turn some LiDAR derived products off and on, and then we'll leave you with some take home resources to where these all live after the fact. Now, one of the questions that we perhaps get asked quite often, um, you know, being geographers, GIS professionals, particularly from the legislature every so often is, aren't you all done mapping yet? You know, haven't you finished this mapping this state that's been around for a while? And the answer is no, in part, the reason for that is that information that is mappable is constantly changing. So given that we're here at a LIDAR talk today, uh, perhaps some of you have seen an image or the physical map, the analog relief map like that on the left hand side of this slide that shows, you know, the Green Mountain Range and, and New Hampshire as uh, White Mountains, you know, as, as the elevations you can touch and feel. The digital proxy for that is on the right hand side, a digital relief. Uh, that information has way more functionality to it and requires us to do lots of things. So the short answer is no, we're not done mapping yet, simply because of the format and the nature of the information is always changing. Uh, it's changing in space, meaning that uh, different realities uh, of digital maps relative to analog or physical maps is that they have different scales or zoom factors and at every level of the map we make there's different relevant information that's associated with that everything from the statewide scale such as the top left frame all the way down to the very uh, fine grain detailed buildings and roads and sideways and individual trees in the bottom right and everything in between uh, there's lots of information to pick that at each one of those scales our spatial information changes with time so for example, you're looking at one particular LIDAR derived product of interest here. This is called a bare earth hillshade. And you're looking at it near the Waterbury region where in uh, 2019, there was a landslide in what's called the Cotton Brook area. You can see that the LIDAR product here, this bare earth hillshade that was taken in 2014 does not depict the current hillshade, that, or I'm sorry, the current landslide that occurred in 2019, but 
paleo era geological events like landslides that if compared again with a shot taken at 2021 shows where that cotton brook landslide did occur. And again, this is just signifying that not only is information changing in space, but also with time and it's uh, one of our tasks to maintain current and relevant information. The things we provide here are, are pretty much uh, do ask a relative barrier to or have a barrier to entry regarding technology. Uh, and so check technology itself, as you well know, is changing over time. Statewide Vermont GIS itself began way back in the early 80s. And you can see this image here where the original vision of looking at all of these different layers um, uh, as a statewide geographic information system for Vermont. The ones that are highlighted in yellow are the ones that at present day have some LIDAR bearing to them. And so the technological means have evolved with time. And so with that, our roles as professionals and how we deliver that product to the public. For example, in 1992, our users would um, either mail or email us for what at the time was 17 megabytes worth of floppy disks of information, GIS information, and we would send it back to them. And obviously that's no longer uh, what we do, but rather we maintain well over 17 terabytes of information that's mostly up in what we now call the cloud, right? These server farms that are located in various locations around the world that serve content through a modern inter internet connection. So we today through that infrastructure, again, are serving massive more amounts of information, whether that's through applications via download, or what we like to call Netflix for maps, which is basically streaming map information over an internet connection through what we call web services that allows you to get the latest, greatest information at always uh, at that point in time in, in your application or your software platform. And part of what we're doing here is maintaining all that behind the, the scenes server and, and internet infrastructure in coordination with Vermont municipalities, regional planning commissions, different state agencies, put it together in one location that we call the Vermont Open Geodata Portal, which itself is harvested by the federal level opendata.gov um, platform that makes this again available as a public information resource. The point I want to emphasize here is that the technology has evolved to such an extent and LIDAR information with it that from 2020 or so onward, it's now possible for us to construct a virtual Vermont for reference. No floppy disks needed. Some of the information that we're going to provide today can show as these sort of images uh, here uh, represent that they have, we have now have a combination of everything from one foot level contour intervals to parcels to 3D buildings, hydrography, ortho imagery, land cover, you name it, that allows you from sort of the comfort of your professional workstation with an internet connection to see this virtual Vermont for reference. And the LIDAR product products are a key component of that, uh, as you see as we cycle through some of the images on the screen here. So let's get to our first stage here. So what is what is LIDAR before we continue? And we're gonna talk about this again as, as if you are new to all of this and, and start with some basic concepts. So point clouds, derivatives, and resolution. So again, LIDAR, really, what is it? Well, in, in kind of a cheeky way, it's shooting lasers at the surface of the Earth. It's getting points in return. And lastly, it's making useful data products from them. So you can see in this illustration here, uh, what we do in particular is steward airborne derived or collected uh, LIDAR information where a plane will shoot light pulses at the surface of the earth. And depending on what they hit, whether that's the top of a tree or a, let's say a, a flat, uh, whether it's pavement or a field surface, a number of what are called returns bounce back to the airplane. And depending on where they hit that surface in question, they're classified relative to how where, where they hit that object and their elevation within. And when you get that information back, you see something here called a point cloud. This is essentially the raw data form collected from airborne LIDAR collection. And this is basically a, a static snapshot of all of these features that the points hit when they were flying by at that point in time. And airborne LIDAR in particular is 
performed at different what we call quality levels, right? How dense the sensors as well as the net mesh network of point densities are taken across the landscape. And what we have currently available for the state of Vermont is what's called QL2 statewide LIDAR, which is about the equivalent of two points per meter squared or basically a one foot contour interval in detail across the entire state. What you notice when you're looking at this is that while this is all fancy and interesting, having all of this information and a bunch of dots isn't really useful, right? You've got to make things from this. But before we get there, I just want to make note that in the broad brush scope of technologies that are used for LIDAR data collection and processing, fixed wing or airborne LIDAR is merely one available tool that we have at our disposal. There's everything from satellites to uh, uh, to drones, to mobile applications of LIDAR, helicopters. Each one has a slightly different best use case for its collection. And we, again, at the state who are tasked with making this information have it freely available for all for everything from you know large to medium to uh, town level planning. Uh, the best application of this is what we call airborne LIDAR. And it too is evolving over time and our products will so too evolve with that as the technology evolves. To give you a little bit more clarification on what we mean by this, you can see this animation here where this is the Vermont State House in Montpelier. Imagine that little blue rectangle moving there. That's a section cut. It's showing how the raw point cloud data is represented, where you can see in the top right the dome becoming visible as the cut moves across. This is just an example to show you that you get this three dimensional network of dots that each has information associated with it that we uh, can take and make derived products from. So this is what we mean by when we say point cloud. From that originating product, we <clears throat> query that information for filtering out based on what we call the first returns or the top of the features that were hit out in the landscape, <clears throat> as well as the ground, the surfaces that represent sort of that bare earth and split those two products apart. And from doing that, we can create these derived products such as what we call a DSM or a digital surface model or at the ground class level, a DEM, a digital elevation model that represents just that bare earth as if you scraped all of the features and structures and buildings and trees away. When you compare the two of them, you create or can create what's called a normalized digital surface model. That's all the things in between that represents the heights of those features and then even more derived products that are actually the useful things that people are most interested in, such as your uh, slope aspect, your contours, your hill shade, and your slope percentage. Each one of these things are what we mean when we say LIDAR derived products or LIDAR derivatives. These are the things that end up being used most often for a variety of purposes. Uh, and this is again an example of what these look like. So to sum up about this in terms of what is LIDAR, it, it ultimately what we mean is we want LIDAR derived products and there's really many of them that are applicable in good fortune in Vermont to all statewide. So each one of these different things, whether it's a digital surface model or the, the slope of uh, pre prevailing slope percentage, uh, the bare earth hill shade, one foot contours, this is available for all, all of these derived products at any one location. As you can see in this example here in Marlboro, Vermont, the different layers turned on. One key point that we want to make note of here is that uh, the current LIDAR products, QL2 products, albeit they are statewide in collection, they do represent a snapshot in time. They're a static representation of that point when that airplane flew across the landscape, captured that point cloud, and all the products were made. And for Vermont, the statewide products themselves are a stitch quilt work of five separate collections that took place between 2013 and 2017. We do make a linked application here called the LIDAR status app that allows you to see, you know, based wherever you are in Vermont to know which one of those collections apply to uh, your particular area of interest. So if you were in Southern Vermont, you know, you were down either in 2017 or 2015 collections, so on and so forth for that respective area. Resolution wise, um, we want to emphasize that again, technological advancements have evolved to the point where 
Um, as recently as at the end of 2019, uh, we were able to have available what we refer to this QL2 LIDAR product. So what that means is prior to that, um, about you know 12 or so years ago, statewide USGS the federal level made available this national elevation data set first at 30 meter resolution and then 10 meter resolution by 2017 and then we took a sort of quantum leap forward in the resolution available with this QL2 product uh, in the right hand image as you can see it's just far more information that we now had our disposal to create these products from um, which is uh, only going to improve with time each one of these products themselves are comprised of many, many individual cells, and this is just another look at that evolution of the resolution from back at that 30 meter digital elevation model, you know, 10, 12 years ago, into the 2019 products that are at what we call 0.7 meter uh, resolution or QL2. They give you a far more fine grain uh, visibility into the landscape to be able to make useful things from. And I should mention that we're not done, so we're not going to get into this today, but you know, there is now the tech, the capability and the technology available to go far beyond the QL2 specification and what into areas we call QL0 and QL1 here. Um, that would provide even more information available to us, and we are in the beginnings of scoping out how to put together the next iteration of statewide LiDAR collections that are an even greater resolution that allow us to make more products and are considering those uses in, in relation with our partners, both at you know, VTRANS, the Agency of Natural Resources, as well as the uh, US Geological Survey, USGS, who are a big uh, partner in all of this and pulling it together. So stay tuned, maybe in the next handful of years, we'll have even greater resolution products available along these lines. Next, next part we want to get into is some examples, some concrete uses of who's using LiDAR and what for. So these are some, uh, some fancy applications that we've come across along the way. And there are, long story short, too many to mention. Um, there are everything from agricultural, archaeological, to planning uses, to emergency management, and dealing with um, disasters after the fact. There's all kinds of uses many of which we aren't really familiar with because we can never predict in advance how people use this, use this foundational information that we make available to them. So I'm just going to provide a cross section. Um, our partners, for example, at the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, the state of Vermont, they have an archaeological division. Uh, they have used our LIDAR information for looking at artifacts, or for example, that were once under glaciers or the former extent of Lake Champlain, as you can see in this image here, as an idea of how those artifacts have been affected by that weathering over time. Um, some of our other colleagues at the Agency of Natural Resources in the Wetlands Division are using it for very fine resolution uh, measurement of water levels and fluctuations in what are classes of wetlands across the state. Uh, it provides that functionality for them. Some private um, entities across the state uh, who are in the solar energy production uh, space are using it for solar assessments, looking at how shadows move across the landscape, looking at uh, basic availability of amount of sunshine so they can know where to target investments for solar. Uh, as well as uh, both design and planning and engineering firms can use our LiDAR information for site suitability assessments. In this image in the bottom right, for example, if you're going to build something on a site, understanding its visibility, how where you can see an object from, depending on uh, the way that the topography and the elevation persists. So these are just a good cross section of, of uses that at least that we're aware of. One particular example that's a good um, relatively recent application comes from our colleagues at Vermont Geological Survey and what I'm going to show here is this isn't an image of say like marble meat this is uh, instead what we call our color infrared imagery that's taken up in Chittenden County um, as you can see there sort of Richmond the town of Richmond and the Winooski River as it winds its way ultimately to Lake Champlain and this is about the former extent of what used to be glacial lakes and in, in the Champlain Sea in this region, which is now, as you know, you know, 
uh, largely Vermont's most populated area. So these are some of the contemporary features out there, everything from the airport to former IBM or Global Foundries, Bolton Valley Access Road, if you've ever skied there. And you can begin to look at a sequence of these images, including LIDAR information in relation to other GIS layers, such as aerial imagery, to start to uncover patterns in the landscape. Here you can start to see again just how the present day Winooski River Valley has formed itself elevation wise into the into the landscape. And if you peel back and really look at that shaded relief digitally, you can see even more information. For example, here's an inset image zooming in on the corner of, of the Winooski River corridor and you can start to make things out such as uh, human made infrastructure like rail lines or roads or even pads to foundations there um, where you see sort of a loop at that uh, bottom left of the inset to the actual uh, tributaries and erosion channels that lead ultimately to the waterway of the present day Winooski itself. See some quarry like features in there as well. All of these are made available again at the resolution that we have available in what's called uh, the digital elevation model presented as a shaded relief. And professionals can do really interesting things like that with this information in relation to other GIS layers, such as the aerial imagery. You can look at the water body features layer that have you know attributes assigned to them, like the name of the rivers and lakes and ponds, the contours that I had mentioned before. You can see those sort of toggle off and on there as I move forward. And then lastly, you know, the infrastructure like buildings and roads, et cetera, uh, in relation to all this. And this is where it gets fascinating. Our colleagues started using this information and mapping out those former, you know, 10 to 13,000 years ago extent of both glaciers and water bodies. And you can start to see them in relation here with the present day landscape. So this is what we call the former extent of the Champlain Sea overlaid on the present day uh, picture to what was called the present day or the former lower Fort Anne extent to the upper Fort Anne period to the former extent of the highest you know, inundation level, which was called the Lake Coville. What's pretty fascinating about this is modern day infrastructure, whether it's the airport or EVM, global foundries, even somewhere you might think pretty high elevation, like halfway up the Bolton Valley Access Road was once under ice and water, surprise, surprise. So again, water, the landscape in Vermont was very much formed and con continues to be shaped by the presence of water. And this is perhaps one telling way of exploring that. This is just another view of that Williston Hill little icon there animated to show how the different levels there all the way from Champlain Sea through Lake Coville basically made a beach at the Williston Hill area there where you can see that little round feature that was more or less an area that um, you know through glaciation and ultimate melting was partially shaped by that over a long long period of time so there's many geological purposes that come with this and this data set again is made freely available at the open geodata portal as one good example of using lidar products for uh, interesting ends Another thing that this gets used for is a lot is flooding or managing risk exposure. So these are examples, you know, a little over 10 years ago of Tropical Storm Irene and its devastation that it brought to Vermont. Um, present day, just a few weeks ago and, and leading up until this week, we are excited to release a new flood related product that was made by uh, using LIDAR products uh, by our colleagues at UVM bunch of researchers who are you know looking at new ways of modeling this this is an example up in Franklin County near Montgomery and Montgomery Center of what currently is still the regulatory or jurisdictional uh, layer called uh, flood insurance rate maps right the FEMA's and national flood hazard layer here you can see those are typically depicted with uh, regulatory floodways and one percent annual chance and the point here is that they're not very fine detail but with LIDAR derived information, you can do a lot more high resolution look at the prevalence of flood risk. And this is an example of looking at that same location with um, this new LIDAR aided flood inundation layer that gives you a snapshot of the likelihood of everywhere between a two year flood zone, 510, all the way up through the one, 200 and 500 um, uh, 
uh, your floods and their relative exposure based on how high or low those uh, places are. So again, this provides an incredible new level of detail at looking at potentially flood, flood risk and making planning decisions thereafter. And just a note that whenever we release this kind of big, big, you know, big information release, we do post about it on our vcgi.vermont.gov website, so you can read about it there. We try and explain what the product is, um, you know, what the different colors mean, how you can go find it in applications and raw data. So this is an example of that one presented here. Another really interesting use of LIDAR that we've we've become aware of through our colleagues at ANR has to do with forestry and natural resources. So if you remember back, I was talking about the normalized digital surface model. Again, that represents the height of feature, whether that's a building or trees or forests, uh, such as this example of the tallest uh, apartment building, at least in the state of Vermont, which is Decker Towers in, in, in uh, downtown Burlington. It's about 124 feet tall. That layer, it looks sort of like a technicolor layer, but it really is representing the height of those features, whether they're building or treetops above the surface. Um, this is one of the useful things that foresters tell us uh, quite frequently that is helpful for their doing their work. To the extent our colleagues made a tool called the What's My Elevation app that you get to at this URL here that allows you basically to search by address or or point and basically move around and, and find your elevation in real time, like up in that top right there of the surface height or the treetop height with you know some good estimation of accuracy just by querying these layers that we now have available statewide. So just one cool example of a simple map that allows you to go in and, and, and say, how, how, how tall is that building or how tall is that tree at that point in time in that location? to even potential new uses of this for forestry and natural resources. Just this morning, we got email from, from, uh, from Esri, from large GIS related organizations saying, hey, because you have this statewide LIDAR information available, I'm testing a way to extract 3D trees throughout, throughout the entire state of Vermont. Here's an example of this. So just again, a snapshot of what can be done that's exciting, we can't predict in advance, um, but there's even more new applications that we anticipate coming down the pipeline. So that being said, how do you get access to all this? How this is all fancy and wonderful. Let's talk about some basic ways to both find and use at least at a high level, some of these products that we make available. So let's talk about some applications and leave you with some resources along those lines. Uh, long story short, there's a couple handful or handful types of applications that we're going to talk about, the most simple of which being what we call theme or task specific applications. For example, like that What's My Elevation app, app or this one I'm about to show in a minute called Beneath the Trees. And then secondly, there are what we call viewer applications that allow you more or less to do just that within your web browser with an internet connection to view not just LIDAR, but other GIS information in relation to one another for a particular location. There are two more types of applications that we won't get into today. Those are the finder or the desktop type applications that are typically devoted to more advanced use, but nonetheless, they are available. And this is kind of an example here of a very simple theme map that we made or a task specific app called the Beneath the Trees app uh, that uh, will provide a link that allows you basically to move that little icon around over an aerial image and it shows you like for example here in the steps of the state house uh, uh, in Montpelier what's underneath that so you can see the steps there in elevation on the bare earth hill shade and you can move that around and it's uh, quite an interesting tool it's relatively simple to use. So with that, I want to pass it over to my colleague Steve who's going to give you an example of what we call a kitchen sink application or a viewer application, and in particular, the Vermont Interactive Map Viewer. So Steve, take it away. Thanks, Tim. And thanks everybody thanks for everybody joining us today. My name is Steve Fugate. I run the LIDAR program with VCGI, and I'm happy to demo the Interactive Map Viewer for you guys. So with that, let's get right into it. OK, so when you click the link on the home page for the interactive map viewer, um, this is what shows up. These are the default settings of the map. Up top, you'll see a series of tabs and notice that the navigation tab is selected by default. 
Each tab provides different functionality, but the navigation tab meets the needs of most users who simply want to zoom and pan around and explore the map. On the left is the table of contents that contains all the map layers. They're organized into two main groups that are comprised of subgroups. The two primary groups are base maps and operational layers. Uh, base maps contain layers that bring visual context to the map and include things like roads, town boundaries, county boundaries, water bodies, streams, rivers, and more. Uh, the operational layers contain more specialized information that is used to support more specific use cases. When we expand the base map group, you'll see that uh, it exposes a cached base map and a dynamic base map. The cached base map is selected by default. Now, cached and dynamic are frequently used terms, uh, but for the sake of this demo, I think the take home message is that cached maps perform better than dynamic maps, but they're static maps, which means you can't toggle individual layers on and off. Well, the dynamic maps are typically slower to render than the cache maps, but they do offer the opportunity to toggle those layers on and off individually. <clears throat> In both cases, um, these maps consist of essentially a series of maps, and, and Tim had a slide earlier that kind of alluded to this, where each map changes depending on the scale that you're viewing it at. As the users zoom in and out, different layers appear and their symbology and labels may change in order to optimize the information that's being communicated. Um, this is done as to not overwhelm the viewer with too much detail when zoomed out. <clears throat> I'd say the real meat and potatoes of the interactive map viewer is within the operational layers themselves. Um, in this slide, you've got the table of contents. Uh, you can expand each group layer to expose the operational layers and the individual layers themselves. Um, here you can see the LIDAR group layer has been expanded, and it actually is comprised of several of those derived layers that Tim mentioned. <clears throat> this here is the LIDAR hillshade, and it's overlaid, overlaid by some base map layers such as roads, water bodies, streams, and buildings. This slide shows a slightly different derived LIDAR layer uh, called the digital surface model. Um, and this one represents everything on the Earth's surface, including the structures and the vegetation. And here you can see the all imagery layers toggled on at the bottom. And this one becomes visible beneath the, when we have the digital surface model by adjusting the transparency of the DSM. And you do that using a slide bar just to the right of the item in the table of contents. So you really do have a lot of flexibility on how you want your map to look. Here's another example of an interesting layer that you can add to the map. <clears throat> this one is the 2016 high resolution land cover map. And this classifies the landscape into groups uh, such as tree, trees, grass, shrub, bare soil, water, buildings, roads, and other paved surfaces, and even railroad features. And, uh, in this slide, we've added the parcel layers on top of the, the land cover map, which offers even more information to the end user. So you can really stack these layers up on top of one another to get a really rich map going. So you might ask, okay, so I can toggle layers on and off, and is that it? Um, no, there's there's more, and I'd say one of the most powerful capabilities of, of the interactive map viewer is that it allows the user to change these default settings of the map and customize their own personal web map so that it meets their own specific needs. <clears throat> in order to do this and customize the map in this way, the, the user must first create an ArcGIS public account. Uh, the, the interactive map viewer is built upon Esri technology, so the ability to edit and customize and save those changes requires that the user first creates a user account. <clears throat> and this can be done using the home tab at the top of the interactive map viewer and the create icon account. Uh, the process is relatively straightforward and should only take a few minutes. Once a public account is created, the user can sign into their account where they can create and save customized web maps and access other content that they've created. Um, this is what Tim sees when he logs into his account. 
And as you can see, he has several different map items that he's developed uh, to meet different end user needs and, and different use cases. <clears throat> so now that we've covered some of the basics, uh, it's time to use the interactive map viewer to support what I understand one of your goals to be, which is to use LIDAR to identify historic features that occur uh, across the landscape. So to demonstrate this, I've used my public ArcGIS account to create a map that I believe uh, supports this goal, and it's called the Historic Society IMV Demo Map. And we'll use this map to explore how to identify historic features in the Little River State Park area. As many of you may know, Little River <clears throat> History Trail Hike is a great place to explore both history and nature at the same time. So I thought it would be a good place to focus for this demo due to the high concentration of known historic features in the area. There are several derived layers to choose from, but the hill shade, the shaded relief one, does a very good job of highlighting terrain features that occur beneath the tree canopy. So that's the one we're going to focus on. <clears throat> Here are portions of the history hike up close. And after exploring the area, just zooming around and panning around, I've discovered some what I think are pretty unusual looking signatures in the, in the LIDAR hillshade that could potentially be historic features. Um, so now that I've identified these areas of interest, my next step would be to use the interactive map viewer to draw lines and polygons on top of these areas of interest so that I can document their physical location within the context of my web map. <clears throat> so in this slide, I've used the draw tool to document these features of interest within the map itself. So when I save my web map, these features will remain as part of the map so I can continue to build this data set up over time. Uh, after digitizing some features, uh, what I did here was I right clicked on top of the features uh, to plot their coordinates. You'll notice the table of contents has changed there to display the newly plotted locations, and you can see the three dots that are there for you to edit and delete these points as needed. Another nice feature is the ability to select your desired coordinate system, which is a matter of personal preference or sometimes depending on how you're going to use this data, you're going to want it in a specific coordinate system. <coughs> And once you've got your map looking how you want it, you can do a few things with it. You can create a printable version of the map. You can export the map as a map image. Or you can export the data itself as a shape file that can then be consumed by smartphone technology to support things like field navigation and field validation and reconnaissance. So with that, I'm going to conclude the demo and turn it back over to Tim for some of his final thoughts. Thank you, Steve. Let me switch over here. All right, so one little last bit before we transition to wrapping up on some of the resources here and open discussion questions <clears throat> is that all of what Steve was just showing there uh, inside the interactive map viewer, nice little feature is that let's say you get a location set up and you've got your layer states and your zoom levels established that you know the image of the map on your your computer screen looks as you want it to you can use the top share button there under the home tab and one of the options to share is an actual little email link there and what that does is it generates at that point in time a unique web url such that you it looks exactly like the map does exactly like it does on your screen for the other person on the receiving end of the email that you send it to. So this is a great way of sort of at least from a read only perspective, sending it to a colleague saying, hey, look at this feature here that I've identified. And once you send them that unique email link that's automatically generated through this share tool this way, they open up in their web browser and it will be zoomed into that exact location and the layers will be toggled off and on just as you set them up when you clicked the email link. So it's just a quick way of sharing mappable information at a point and a location that you want people to focus on in a certain way. Now the 
we've been sort of singing the praises of a freely available browser based GIS light viewer in uh, through the interactive map viewer, it does come with caveats and it's worth noting what the IMV is not. So it is a viewer. It is not a full fledged freely available GIS solution in your browser, right? So it's while you can draw some shapes with lines or polygons and make some annotations, either text and coordinates, it's not really a digitization platform for extensive professional use or a cartographic platform or geoprocessing and spatial analysis platform or data management platform. It allows you to do simple things and simple tasks, mostly functioning on what it's called, which is being a viewer. Um, if you need something that's more robust and, uh, for bigger sc scale professional endeavors, it is not the tool to use. Um, it is what we call again a kitchen sink app that has pros and cons. For example, it's got a lot of things that are preloaded in there, but beyond that, you know, custom use lends itself to other applications, including, including GASP desktop GIS. It's not an alternative to uh, some of the needs that one might have there for custom or professional use. But the, the good actually caveat with it is that it is suited for trial and error. Um, our advice is really if you load up the IMV in a browser, um, essentially learn and trial by clicking on some buttons, click the tabs, toggle things off and on, look at that ribbon type layer of functions ac across the top. You're not going to break anything by simply you know, pressing buttons in it. Don't worry about that. It's often the best way to figure out what is and isn't possible with a tool like the IMV is to actually go in there and, and, and start clicking things and watch what it does to your map window. Um, you won't, again, you won't break anything by doing so. And for those users that get even more curious at looking at all of the raw data products in GIS format that we provide, as we mentioned here and beyond, um, the Vermont Open Geodata Portal is essentially the clearinghouse for all of this, including elevation products. Um, the LiDAR derived content is at a specific location called the elevation page, which is at this URL here. Products there are served uh, in downloadable data sets and what we call web services that are referenceable, you know, that live internet enabled connection to the data in real time. Uh, some linked applications um, like the viewer and finder apps that we've mentioned are also linked from there, as well as some related documentation. You know, I want to understand how certain layers are created. There are links to PDF documents that go into how these things are made and documented there as well. And again, really all of this here is available through these related links. So the LiDAR program itself that Steve heads up is available at the top. We've got an FAQ section that evolves over time. If we get you know more than a handful of the same kind of question answered, we add, uh, add an FAQ there. So uh, it's good to note if you ask us more than once, we, we tend to keep that live and up to date. Uh, some other tools that we showed here, like those theme or task specific map are linked here as well, like the Beneath the Trees app, the What's My Elevation app, and the Finder as well. Um, if you want to keep up to date on if and when LiDAR related or any other State of Vermont GIS related big sort of data releases or new endeavors are made, we do announce them there at what's called the VCGI uh, news page, news and announcements, for example, like the new data release about the flood layer that just was made available. That's where that is. And lastly, we also provide a number of links to related resources for going further in your own discovery of how to use this stuff. I must say that um, GIS is extremely complicated in the sense that at once it's super accessible and a public information resource and while also being at the same time something that you know folks like Steve and myself can spend our entire professional careers doing and still never master. So it is everything in between and we do our best to um, provide a uh, way of, of sort of self-directing learning resources there, including links to other GIS platforms that are free of charge, like QGIS, et cetera. And also, if you get curious about information beyond LiDAR, some of our other foundational data sets are linked there at the bottom, such as our, it's called our Vermont uh, Ortho Imagery Program, as well as our statewide parcel program that collates and aggregates and publishes municipal parcel data statewide. 
So really, again, you can always lastly reach out to either Steve and or I. Um, uh, feel free to email us uh, you know, after the fact if you don't have questions now. But uh, thanks again. Uh, we really appreciate you showing up and uh, showing interest in our LIDAR program and products.